Coulter's uh, now driving as well. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about how he learned how to drive. <laughs> Dave, members of this ARM board, delegates to the, uh, to the convention, to the annual convention, uh, good morning and thanks again for the chance to be with you to share some thoughts about the, the past and the present and the future. I want to join with all of you in thanking Doug for his heroic actions. That is the kind of story you, uh, we, we assume only happens in the movies or on TV and uh, uh, what, a, what a remarkable act of heroism and selflessness. So thank you for that, Doug, and for that inspiration. I want to thank each and every one of you for what you have done over the last year and what you will continue to do on behalf of your communities, on behalf of your rural municipalities. And I especially want to thank those who were on the front lines of a 1 in 500 year flood in many parts of this province. Last spring we were there with the MLAs uh, on more than one occasion and uh, obviously the follow up work is still happening today. But boy, it was my experience as I traveled around the, the southeast and other parts of the province that were hit by by uh, very difficult weather, it was uh, just, it's, it's just my observation that there's nothing like committed frontline municipal leaders, urban and rural, to deliver that frontline response to those to floods or other disasters. And you should give yourselves a, a round of applause. I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the province. So let me tell you about this guy from rural Saskatchewan. He grew up in a uh, small town a place where kids could roam freely and get into maybe a little bit of mischief. The man came of age at a time of real optimism in the province of Saskatchewan. Investment was pouring in to this province and to his part of this province. Investment was developing mining, specifically developing enormous potash resources. There were jobs to be had, a lot of them. So the man tried his hand at mining for a time, and he was pretty good at it. And then he decided to give farming a whirl. And I'm not sure if he was good at that or not. He was working hard, though, on the farm to raise his family, to be involved in his community. And he decided, in addition to all of that, to run for RM Council. He figured it was better to get involved than sit on the sidelines and complain. One term turned into two, two turned into three, and pretty soon he was elected Reeve. Like all RM councillors, he was preoccupied with the nuts and bolts of local government, with delivering service for his neighbors at lowest possible cost to his neighbors. And he was troubled by what he began to, began to see in the province of Saskatchewan and in his area. This man fervently believed in rural Saskatchewan, though fortunes seemed to be changing. He knew the people of rural Saskatchewan. He knew their self-reliance. He knew their determination and their generosity. He saw the underlying strength of Saskatchewan in rural Saskatchewan. He saw the bedrock of this province. In this area, this land that we call home, that he called home of vast natural resources, he saw a storehouse, a literal storehouse that the world envied. But he also saw that some didn't seem to be quite as optimistic about the future of rural Saskatchewan. He saw that some were pre predicting its decline, its inevitable decline. He had a different vision. His vision was of a growing and prosperous rural Saskatchewan. There seemed to feature inevitable depopulation and a steady decline in services then in rural Saskatchewan. He noted this assessment was shared by some in leadership, by some academics, and it drove Bob Benrod into politics more than 15 years ago. He got involved because of his passion for his community, because of his passion for rural Saskatchewan. He got involved because he wanted to help sustain the promise of Saskatchewan. And we are very, very grateful today that he made that decision. 
So I'm going to spend a little bit of time to recognize Bob's tremendous contribution to our organization, and I'll probably get into some political stories here that might be a little partisan. Let me apologize for them uh, in advance. But I do want to, on behalf of his colleagues and on behalf of a grateful province, pay a tribute to, uh, to Bob and, and thank him. When I was first elected in 1999, Bob Benrod was our first whip, as you heard in his introduction. And early on, I, I liked the very first conversation I had with Bob went like this. He said, I know the ages of your kids, and he repeated them to me. I know you, have, you and Tammy have a young family. You need to know this, that as long as I'm the whip, this is a family-friendly organization. And yes, you need permission to be away from the legislature, uh, but I want you to know that that'll be readily available because you'll have to attend your family, and if you simply can't get to me to ask, just go. We'll be, we'll be just fine. He told that to other young parents who were serving in the legislature. He made sure our families knew that that should be our priority, and maybe it's, it's the perspective that he had raising his own. That was my first meeting with, with Bob. So despite what June had said, I, I liked him right off, <laughs> right off the top. When Bob told me that he wanted to step down from cabinet at the time of the next shuffle, I, I wasn't surprised, because Bob is very, very, very old. <clears throat> no, <laughs> no I, I, I was surprised, because, um, because of uh, the passion he had for the work and the job that he has done uh, and the changes that he has made with respect to the ministry. And by the way, just before I came up, Bob said he was remiss in forgetting to thank his staff in the office and the ministry team that he's worked with, and so he asked me to do that. I do so, I do so now. I agree with Dave. I think Bob, I mean, right now he's the longest-serving provincial ag minister in the country, and I agree with Dave that you, if you check the history of the province, you might find an ag minister that was almost as good as Bob, but that will be difficult to do just based on his record over the last four years. He has been a relentless advocate for this sector, for farmers, for the, for the rural sector, for rural communities as well as agriculture, at the cabinet table and at the caucus table. And you know, it's true, when, it, when it's Bob's turn to speak in cabinet, you can kind of hear the eyes rolling because we all know what's coming and that's going to be an ask or an advocacy for rural Saskatchewan. And I'll tell you, he wins more arguments than he loses to the great credit of he, uh, to his team, to the great credit of him and his team. It's hard to believe that that guy was consumed with some self-doubt when he walked into that legislature with that empty briefcase. <laughs> June tells that story a little bit as well. Uh, and her version has a, a, a quote from Bob when he first entered the legislature, telling June, quote, what the hell is a farmer from Salt Coach doing in a building like this? But pretty soon he got to feel more comfortable. As June tells us, he enlisted her help in trying to sneak his Shih Tzu, his beloved Shih Tzu bugs, into the legislative building, <clears throat> where June would distract the commissioners while Bob did that. <clears throat> and I think that begs another question. What the heck is a farmer from Salt Coats doing with the Shih Tzu? <clears throat> And now more, I think. <laughs> Bob Benrod was outstanding, is outstanding, in the Legislative Assembly. You won't find someone as able a debater as he. That was true when he was in opposition asking questions. It was true as Agriculture Minister. The very first question he was asked as the Agriculture Minister was from the opposition who held up a file and they were raising a beef issue which was important to the province at the time so I give the, the opposition credit but they held up a file and they said Mr. Speaker this file is full of people concerned about the state of the beef industry and they want this government to do something and Bob Benrod I think again with June's help immediately stood up and he had a file of his own it was empty and he said well I've got a file too this is a record of all that you did to help agriculture in 16 years Bob mentioned that he was a liberal at one time. It's not something he talks about much. <laughs> but
But you need to know he played a key role in the formation of our party, as did those original eight, and uh, they are well represented here today. Bob was uh, one of the first. In fact, Bob Benrod and Bill Boyd started talking about the potential of a new party early on and decided to meet over at Bill's apartment on one occasion, and uh, Bob came over to chat about it, and if you hear Bill tell the story, he'll say, I, I think I had between about a dozen and 18 beer in the fridge, uh, and uh, we, we met for a long time, and when I woke up the next morning, I decided if I was ever going to invite Bob over to talk politics, maybe I'd only have a six-pack in the fridge. <laughs> <clears throat> Bob and I, though, have had our rocky moments. And I'll tell a story that I know I've told before, and some of you have heard it, but it bears repeating. I won't get to tell it on him very much. It's a true story about pre-government days when we were at a caucus planning uh, session in Jackfish, I think. And we were all in opposition, and we had a state night, and uh, after a day's worth of work and meetings, and I was walking around eating my steak, because I'm because I do dumb things like that from time to time, if you talk to Tammy, walking and talking while you're eating. And I, sure enough, I, it, it got, a piece of steak got caught in my throat, and I started to choke. And I was trying not to draw any attention to myself, but I increasingly was getting worried as I couldn't breathe, and I think my color was, was changing, and uh, nobody was really doing anything about it. I was, pretty, I was pretty sure they could see I was in some distress, but nobody was doing anything. Finally, Daryl Hickey, not yet an MLA, but running for us, and a uh, police officer came up, he noticed, he said, are you okay? And uh, just then everything was, it had cleared itself and everything was fine. So later that night, a bunch of us are sitting around and I said, Bob was there, I said to a bunch of them, there were veterans, I said, you know, I almost choked to death. You guys saw me choking to death and you didn't do anything. You weren't doing anything. And Bob Penrod said, I was doing something. I was planning my leadership campaign. <laughs> jerk. <laughs> Bob's son Grant uh, talks, tells a story about his dad playing senior baseball on one particular occasion getting pretty upset because the opposing team is sliding into the bases with their spikes high and uh, Bob not only tells him that that's not the right thing to do but is prepared to, uh, uh, to back up his comments uh, and mete out a little bit of justice and did that successfully as well and he says, uh, his, his son says, like anything else he does, he does it at full speed, 100% passionate, right or wrong. Well, we are blessed in our government, and I would say in our province, that he has approached this job uh, as agriculture minister and as MLA for Melville Saltcoats uh, with a 100% effort, with the passion that has delivered results for this important sector and for all of you, his fingerprints are all over the first years of our government, and we're much better for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bob's run over some of the highlights over the last four years of what we've done, and we know there's more work to do in a number of areas. I won't repeat all of those things, but I do want to tell you a little bit about the importance of agriculture in our government's plans moving forward, not just for rural Saskatchewan, but really agriculture's importance to our growth plan for this entire province that we want to see continuing uh, to lead the country. You know, when, when we were recently in London and Ireland, I found myself talking about agriculture a lot as I have been lately, especially in Ireland, because as we talked to those people lined up, the lineups to get into that job fair you may have heard on the news were sometimes close to a kilometer long with 2,000 young people in Ireland being turned away from, from either of those days of the job fair that, were in, that was in Dublin. And I went up and down the line to talk to them, uh, to hear their story and to let them know that they're going to get in because I think some were concerned they wouldn't actually get in to apply for some jobs. And you know the stories they told were sad and tragic and then they followed up the stories with a question when they found out what my job was. They said, you know, things were really good here in Ireland for a long time. And now there's been a crash, and look at the lineup. So what's to say that won't happen in this place that you're from? If we sign on, if we come to the province. And I was able to tell them about you. The difference between this province and Ireland and other economies that unfortunately are going through a lot of pain right now is that the fundamentals for this economy, for your economy, are strong. 
You see, the fastest growing economies of the world today, they prize two things, most of all, food security and energy security. Why, that's just what we have. That is what we are a storehouse for. That doesn't mean we're not going to cycle, that there's going to be ups and downs. This is a commodity-driven economy, and you know your sector. But in terms of long-term prospects in this world, I like our chances. It's why we want to continue to invest in the sector and partner with rural Saskatchewan. It's why in the, last, in the election campaign, we were talking about and committed to a brand new Global Food Security Institute at the University of Saskatchewan, where we partner with that institution, but also with companies to take the next step, the next generational step in investing in plant science, in transportation technology, in leading the world in food production, build the next economy on the strength of this current economy. It's why we've announced additional funding for research and development in agriculture, another $10 million for wheat research. Bob's been pointing out that wheat hasn't been getting the attention in terms of research dollars that it should. We hosted a wheat summit attended literally by the world just uh, weeks ago. And we're going to continue to focus on agricultural issues. We're going to continue to listen to SAR. We may not get to places you'd like us to get as quickly as you'd like, but we're going to get there because the sector and agriculture is fundamentally important to our plan for the Saskatchewan advantage, for our plan to see this province leading the country. And we're going to lean on you for some advice and for some administration of programming. And we hope that partnership can last. Bob mentioned a number of maybe smaller initiatives that I think speak to the relationship. There's, I'll talk a little bit about revenue sharing and infrastructure, but when you consider what we have done with you because of your advice on beavers, gophers, coyotes, rats, wild boars, I think Sarm ought to start listing the animals they actually like. That might actually be a... <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. These are, these are, Dave says it'll be a shorter list. I mean, these are challenges, and we want to be able to listen to the sector so that we're properly responding to them. By the way, in terms of the whole coyote uh, bounty thing, while this NHL team talk is going on, let's ease up on the coyote bounty <laughs> chat. We know we've got work to do in infrastructure. We've made significant investments in our first term. We spent $4.1 billion compared to $2.1 billion the four years prior to that. In highways alone, we spent $2.4 billion over those four years compared to one4 over that same period prior to the change in 07. And we know, though, that there's more work to be done. Uh, we know that MREP's an important function of SARM and for the province. And while we're making some tough decisions in this, in this budget upcoming and seeing some cuts, uh, we're going to be able to make some important investments in that and I think also monitor it throughout the year to see what else might be possible as the fiscal picture of the province becomes clearer. We know there's more to do. We encourage SARM and SUMA to continue to work together on a longer term infrastructure plan. I don't know if the feds will be a part of it. We'll certainly make the ask. But in a growing province, one of the challenges that we, what we prize, that we welcome, is infrastructure and we're going to need to work together to highlight what resources are available from the provincial side and also develop that plan together with both sectors, the SUM, uh, SUMA and SARM, and we're prepared to do that. We know there's work underway with respect to the revenue sharing formula. Some important decisions that have to be made there between the sectors and uh, uh, we encourage you to come to a swift agreement on all of those very easy questions that you're dealing with. <laughs> I'm looking down at SUMA and over at SARM. We get along. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Just before I move on to the budget, uh, and I'll close with that, I'll just briefly touch on what's coming up in the budget. I do want to talk a little bit about Viterra, if I can, Dave, um, because I know you've touched on it. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be all ears on this one in terms of the, this room and the agriculture sector of the province of Saskatchewan. And uh, it's, it's our view in government that we need to be as deliberate uh, and as, uh, as thorough uh, on this particular uh, takeover proposal as we tried to be with respect to the Potash Corporation and BHP, which I think worked out well for all parties concern, concerned. And we note and welcome the fact that BHP continues to make a huge investment in the province in the wake of that decision. With respect to Viterra, we've, we've simply said this. There's no, there's no takeover bid yet on the table. We already have a team assembled within government 
uh, that when it is, they're going to be tasked with knowing that deal from every angle, from every corner, so that we can analyze what's best for the province of Saskatchewan. We want to be a place that's open to foreign investment. It builds much of the province today, uh, but we'll also need to look at certain things, especially like, especially such as competition issues. If, for, for example, some of the takeover proponents are grain companies, uh, what does that do in terms of uh, competitive options for farmers? These are all questions we, we will uh, analyze very carefully be, and eventually we will make, if there is a takeover bid, we will make our recommendation to the federal government. The head office, the presence of Viterra is important to us. But you know what? Uh, we're interested in what you have to say. Uh, and through your MLAs, uh, through the ministry, through the minister, uh, please uh, feel free to share uh, your views on Viterra if there, indeed there is a takeover proposal that comes forward and it looks like that's going to be the case. With respect to the budget, there's been some talk about it already. You've heard us say, you've heard me say that look, we're going to uh, make some difficult decisions in this particular budget. We've had others criticize those initial comments by saying, well, to the, to the government, which is it, austerity or prosperity? It's both, ladies and gentlemen. In this province, it's always been both. It's what my dad, who was in a small businessman for all of his life, taught me. That was his example. You can't sustain prosperity. You can't sustain a, a financial advantage in the long term if you're not careful with dollars in the short term, if you don't exercise fiscal discipline. We can't ensure that we have programs to help people in the long term. We can't ensure their sustainability if we're not prepared to have the courage to make some adjustments in the meantime to ensure that sustainability. Don Drummond, who recently wrote the report with respect to Ontario's fiscal situation, said this, and I quote, high debt governments are always vulnerable to the whims and demands of the financial markets from which they have borrowed. Governments in this position can be forced to take draconian measures to keep their lenders happy. Greece and Italy are recent vivid examples. Low debt governments have much more flexibility to set their own priorities, ones that meet the needs of their citizens and the good of their jurisdictions as a whole." Close the quote. Today, in that province, we see a government that's being advised to eliminate some programs, important programs that help people because the fiscal situation is as dire as it is. We want to avoid that. The Saskatchewan advantage today is the fiscal strength of this province. The Saskatchewan advantage today, our, our, our unique story that we're able to tell in Ireland is that Unlike any place else on the planet, we've just got a credit rating upgrade to AAA, while other countries, formerly stable economic countries, are getting downgrades, unfortunately. Part of the Saskatchewan advantage is, of course, balanced budgets and debt retirement. Ken Crevettes, the finance minister, will next week introduce the budget. And it will highlight that even in these good economic times, we need to be vigilant. And we need to make sure there's fiscal discipline, and we're prepared to do that. I can tell you that some programs will be eliminated. Not a lot, but some. We will ask others to partner with us in unique ways for other decisions that we're going to make. Here's an example. When it comes to our plan to keep the Saskatchewan advantage, to move this province forward, we're going to focus on the fundamentals. Balanced budgets, competitive taxes, paying down the debt, innovation, uh, infrastructure investment. We would like to see as much of the financial resources of our province available for those priorities as possible. And so we're going to leave local and regional economic development to localities and to regions. I have served on what used to be called RITAs for a number of years in my previous jobs. I know the work they do. They can and they should continue, but we're going to ask that they continue as local economic development vehicles if that's the decision of localities. What you won't have to worry about is revenue sharing. We are going to continue with the program that serves this province very well. This fiscal year, municipalities will receive $217 million. It's a 29.5 percent increase from the previous year. 70% higher than the amount paid out four years ago. Next fiscal year, we can already know, we have that predictable formula, revenue sharing will grow by another 9.5%. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see a budget where in education and in health care we're asking for efficiencies uh, and the number of the increase for municipalities is going to be significantly higher than any other investment the budget will make uh, next week. Thanks. We will get to the point we need to be in terms of infrastructure investment in this province together with your efforts as I've already highlighted and we will continue to respond to other needs so that we can keep up with the challenges of growth that we know you face on the front line. By way of conclusion, let me just say this. When we discuss the recent success of the province of Saskatchewan, when I talk about it, I tend to use a lot of numbers, I use a lot of big numbers. I've used some this morning up probably. But behind all of those numbers are people. That's the real Saskatchewan advantage. This room is the real Saskatchewan advantage. And you are writing a new story for this province that we have to ensure is sustainable. It's a story that's being written in places like Invermay, where Brad and Raylene Oy just opened up a new business. It's called Wandering Moose Gas and More Brad came home from the Alberta oil patch to join his wife in running a business, and so far, no regrets. That story is being written in Yorkton, where Donnie Tejoso works and lives. He's a Filipino immigrant who was thrilled to receive his permanent resident status. His YouTube posting includes a quote that reads, On the next phase of this journey, I pray to God to guide and help me for my citizenship. And I will be ever grateful to say, I was born a Filipino, and I will die a Canadian in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. It's being written near Edgley, where Frank Gronwick and his wife Carrie are growing wheat and canola and peas. He's from the nation of France. She's from the country of Alberta. <laughs> they were named Saskatchewan's outstanding young farmers last year. He said he was looking for a big place to accommodate big dreams. He found it here in the Saskatchewan that you are building. He found a place in a world that is very uncertain economically, whose population is growing. He found a place where job creation records are being set. He found a place where investment is increasing while it is being decreased around the world. He found a place that Don Cherry says is the richest province in Canada. And Don Cherry's like the internet. If he says it, it must be true. <laughs> he found a place in this world today with all of its uncertainty that truly, without fear of hyperbole, is offering hope and opportunity. He found the Saskatchewan advantage and we need to preserve it. We need to keep it. We need to take the decisions now that make sure that advantage lasts for a long time, lasts for a generation or longer. And with your help, that's exactly what we can do. That's what Bob will have us do. And someday, four years from now, maybe he's on the other end of the phone calling us. Bob, thank you for everything that you've done. Ladies and gentlemen, SARM, thank you for what you do every day to create the Saskatchewan advantage. May God bless our province.